Good morning, church. What a beautiful Sunday morning we have today. Um, I'm up here to give a little context on why we've invited uh, Dave Ripley to, uh, to share with us this morning. And uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, myself and the, the board, we've been wrestling this past year with everything that's been going on. Um, all the truth and the lies that are being shared and spread. struggled with how do we how do we deal with this? What do we do? And as we uh, went through this uh, election cycle, and we now have a new president, during the um, uh, preamble to that, uh, Joe, Bison, Joe Biden, someone who said he wanted to bring unity, he said, uh, this election was about the soul of our country. And I believe truer words were never spoken. Unfortunately, I also believe that uh, the soul of our country is in jeopardy. And for our president, who said he wanted to bring unity, within minutes of being in office, he reversed the Mexico City policy. So this is quoting from the, Mex or the Wall Street Journal. And I quote, Mr. Biden on Thursday issued a presidential memorandum to protect and expand access to comprehensive reproductive health care as part of a series of health care related actions. Among its effects will be to reverse a rule known as the Mexico City policy. End quote. The Mexico City policy restricted our tax dollars from going and supporting abortions overseas in foreign countries. And when I was doing the research, I was shocked. They call it family planning. And it's appalling. Uh, going back to the Wall Street uh, Journal article, uh, and I quote, he has said he backs ending a provision in spending bills known as the Hyde Amendment, which bars federal funds from being used for abortions except in limited cases. So clearly, this is a, uh, an administration that is not interested in bringing unity to our country. Um, and it just feels like we've lost the battle. But before everybody jumps up and goes and gets your guns, I want to remind us of two things. First and foremost, we know we win. Amen. We are the victors. However, um, we are in a spiritual battle. And we are warriors of that spiritual battle. So if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, I'd like to um, bring the word of God. Starting with chapter 10. Finally, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you all where you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication, in the spirit and watching thereof, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, Pastor Mike has done an outstanding job of preparing us for this spiritual battle and arming, arming us with the full armor of God. And as for me and my house, we're not going to go down without a fight. So we've asked David Ripley to be here. And as a board, we're looking for something that we can gather around and rally around to, to make a difference. We've been silent, the silent majority for too long, and I personally regret for uh, being silent and take ownership for um, what has happened within our country. So, uh, as you know, I've uh, had the opportunity to move part-time to Boise, and the Lord has uh, introduced me to some amazing people. Um, 
One, I want to introduce uh, Kelly Lowell, the son of my faith heroes, Jerry and Wanda. Uh, he's also associated with uh, Idaho Chooses Life on their board, and he's here to support David today. Um, so please make him feel welcome. So now it's my pleasure to call up David Ripley with Idaho Chooses Life, who's a graduate from the University of Minnesota with a history in, or a degree in history and philosophy. Now the interesting thing about this man is he came to Idaho to fix our red state uh, as a democratic socialist. But God, and I'll let David explain that. <laughs> Your burden is heavy. 
And I just want to encourage you because the Lord will hear those prayers and the Lord will act on those prayers and He hears your cries for mercy. When I came to Idaho, I was here to get Congressman Stallings elected, which we did. And I recognized that Idaho was in serious, serious trouble. It was way too conservative for its own good. There were hardly any Democrats in the Idaho legislature. <clears throat> and what Idaho needed most of all, I knew in my heart, was a good dose of socialism to get itself straight. So I said I, I stayed, I had decided to stay in the great state of Idaho and set up the first ever Democrat consulting firm. And I went to work, at, my primary client was the Idaho Education Association, and I went to work trying to get Democrats elected to the legislature to fix all that ailed you. And uh, weaved into that story was the uh, abortion war. I had always been pro-choice, but it was mostly a political thing. When I got to the great state of Idaho, virtually every Democrat, uh, elected Democrat, was pro-life. In fact, I don't believe there was a single publicly pro-choice Democrat uh, in the state of Idaho. But by 1990, I had fixed that, and there were only three Democrats left who were pro-life. Every single Democrat in the state of Idaho announced that they were committed to a woman's right to choose. We defeated many pro-life Republicans for their work on the abortion issue. And in fact, I was so good at it that in 1991, the Democrats uh, almost took control of the Idaho State Senate. Uh, it was actually tied. And uh, it, uh, Butch Otter was the uh, lieutenant governor at the time and had to, he could never go to the bathroom because he had to be there to settle all the all the uh, tied votes, and, and the fact is uh, it was through that experience that I became more and more committed to the pro-choice cause. And you'll notice the term pro-choice is never completed. It's a dangling uh, sentence or participle or whatever, right? The thought is never finished. A woman's right to choose. And I can tell you that all those hours of, with my Democrat friends sitting in Penn Gilly's saloon talking about how we we're going to, you know, protect a woman's right to choose, we never finished the sentence either. We never thought of ourselves as evil. Because Satan has this very funny way of shading the truth and cutting the corners and protecting you from your own sin and leading you deeper and deeper into trouble thinking you're doing good I was convinced I was doing good and I was setting Idaho free and I can tell you that I was the most effective messenger and worker in his evil empire In 1994, all of that came home to roost for me. I was so good at what I did that uh, the Idaho Education Association bought out my consulting firm and brought me on staff as the first political director in their history, the first non-teacher staff person. And I had a great office, I had a secretary, I had an expense account, but I had a oodles of money to spend to continue to fix Idaho. But in that year, 1994, the woman I was married to at the time, we had, we had only been married about two years, and we had wanted to, uh, to have a child of our own, and we, we, we did get pregnant that year. And it was a joyful thing. We went and 
saw his picture in an ultrasound. And then things started to get very strange in the in the relationship and in, in around that pregnancy. And within weeks, it seemed, the marriage was in trouble, <clears throat> and his life was in trouble. And she announced to me that she did not want to be married anymore, and she did not want to bring that baby's to term. And for the first time, really, I began to think and understand what abortion was. The reality of the bumper stickers met the reality of this innocent life being destroyed. And even now, after all these years in this fight, I, I'm still embarrassed to confess to you how little I understood about what it was I was doing. When she announced that she was contemplating an abortion, I went to various Democrat lawyer friends I had and tried to get them to help me go to court to defend it because I just couldn't get my mind around the fact that this innocent baby was going to be destroyed and there was nothing I could do about it. And they just laughed at me for being so stupid. It's like, uh, hey Ripley, where have you been? Okay. Don't you understand what row is? Don't you understand what time it is in America? Women are free and you don't exist until that baby is born. We couldn't get you into court with the shoe horn. Okay? I don't know what to tell you. I feel bad for you. You seem all kind of upset, but there is no way you're going to get into court to protect him. So I was left to plead with her to spare his life. And I was on a trip for the IEA. I was supposed to go up North Idaho to meet with candidates. And it, this was prior to the days when Apple phones were you know, all rage. And so I was stopping at Pace phones calling, trying to plead with her as I drove up that road. And I got somewhere near uh, Worley, and she said to me, Tomorrow, I'm going in tomorrow, and I don't want to talk about this anymore. It's not your decision, it's my decision. You should read your literature. phone in this phone booth. And the reality of what I had done and the reality of my responsibility, not just for his life, not just for my failure as a father and as a husband, but that David writes in songs about how that sword is turned into, my, you know, his own heart. That sword is plunged into my heart. Because I, I realized that the full magnitude of what I had spent my life doing, that I was not only responsible for his death, I was responsible for an unknown number of deaths. Because her words were correct, I had campaigned and defeated many pro-life Republicans on the bumper sticker of a woman's right to choose. And now the sentence was being finished for me. And there was nothing I could do about it. And I could not the guilt and the shame that overwhelmed me that night was just unbearable. And all I could think 
to do. I just wanted to die. I just couldn't live with this. So I drove up to St. Joe and uh, found a uh, parking space in the campground up there and took an overdose of uh, Zoloft, uh, 5,000 milligrams of Zoloft. And I knew that I would be able to uh, pass away quietly from the drug overdose if I could just get to sleep. So I laid down in the back of the Suburban just wanting to die. And I know this is going to sound weird, but it's the truth. Uh, the fact is, every time I started to doze off, one of my legs would move. And I don't mean twitch either, I mean like somebody was lifting up my leg and moving it. Just enough to annoy me. And this went on for hours, okay? And finally the sun came up and I was still laying there waiting to die in the back of the suburb. And sick as all get out, I'm telling you. And I'm laying out the back of the truck just puking my guts up and the sun is coming up and I think this is just the worst thing ever. I can't believe this. This is not going to work. <clears throat> that was pretty much the bottom of the barrel right there, I think. I ended up crawling into a Coeur d'Alene and getting a room at the Flamingo Motel on Sherman Avenue, which is still there. And that was, uh, I crawled into that place, a broken person. Quite sick too, by the way. I mean, like, it was bad. I was in bad shape. I was out of hope. I was sick from the drugs. I was sick of despair. I was without hope. But in that room was a Gideon's body. I didn't really have anybody to talk to. All my friends, all my associates, my whole world couldn't understand what I was talking about and what I was going through. And the people I knew that would have agreed with me were my enemies, one of whom is right there, Kelly Walton. <coughs> so it was pretty much as alone as you can get. And the Lord had to get me into that place in order to teach me anything. I'm a very stubborn person, and it took a couple of two-by-fours to get me into that place, to answer the prayers of my grandparents long years and years ago, to bring me back to the end of myself so that I began to realize that here's the deal. I can't keep living the way I'm living. It doesn't work. And I can't die because apparently the Lord's not going to let me get up from underneath this that quickly and easy. So I got to find a new way to live. And my way does not work. And it was in those several days in that little motel room on Sherman Avenue that the Lord began to reach down and take hold of me. I want to read one of the psalms that I that I ran across in that motel room. Psalm 18. 
The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. In verse 16, he reached down from my eye and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. I'll tell you one of the most amazing, amazing, almost incomprehensible things about the Lord is that last line I read, because he delighted in me. I knew he rescued me, but how could he delight in me? Everything about me was disgusting to myself. I had judged me unworthy to live. How, what was there about me that he could possibly love? And isn't that the greatest mystery? Isn't that the greatest mystery that is so, it is so astounding that I think it keeps people away from his grace because it's so unbelievable. Because in our hearts we know we deserve condemnation. How can we accept the grace? How can a God love us? What's to love? And yet, while we were still in a state of sin, he gave himself for us. That is the amazing truth of the gospel. That while we were yet drowning in our sin, he gave himself for us because he loves us, because he delights in us, because he has plans for us, because he sees us as he intends us to live and to be. There's scripture that says, that we are God's. There's a mind bender for you. What does that possibly mean? I believe it means when he says he made us in his image, he meant it. We share May, even in our fallen state, we share those reflections of his greatness and goodness. And what he has intended for us, we can barely grasp. And Satan wants to keep it that way. In the image of God, we are made in the image of God. I don't think we really have begun to scratch the surface of what that really means. But that is the key to the abortion issue. Why is abortion raging across the planet? Why is Satan so committed to the destruction of the babies in the womb? Because we're made in God's image and he wants to defile that creation. And he wants us to help him defile that creation. And it starts with something really, really profound. I gave a talk to a group of 
high school boys once I didn't get invited back for some reason, I don't know. <clears throat> and I told them that uh, they were just coming into their sexual prowess as they began to be, they were in the 16, 17, 18 year old range. And I told them that that sexual power is the most powerful force on the earth. I think it's more powerful than nuclear weapons. Because it is the moment, it is the way in which God and man cooperate in the creation of life. It is an astounding thing to contemplate that we are able to cooperate with God in the creation of new life. And Satan wishes to corrupt that and has corrupted it. He wishes to, to turn this great <coughs> gift into our greatest weakness. And how many lives have been destroyed around sexual issues. It's astounding. It is just astounding. All to corrupt our nature and to corrupt the creation and to throw it back in the Lord's face that we are made in His image. The abortion issue, I think, is like no other issue on the earth. On pol in politics today, and in terms of the issues that we face, and there are legions of them, but at the heart of it, I think, is the abortion issue. Every institution in America has been corrupted by abortion. Our medical profession has been corrupted by abortion. Our legal profession has been corrupted. Our educational system has been corrupted. The culture certainly has been corrupted. Last night when I had the chance to talk to the, the men of this church, I told them that the second great lie that Satan has voiced that this sport of legalized abortion is that it's a woman's issue that it's about a woman's body. And what that means is that Satan has pushed men out of the equation. That is not what God intends. That's exactly, he wants men to be disarmed, cast aside, so that women have to confront this problem by themselves. That is not God's will. And that is a that is a terrible dereliction of man's duty to women, children, and to the Lord. But the first great lie, the first great lie of Satan is that this is not a human being, that it is not a baby, that it is a byproduct of some conceptual biological blah 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 collection of cells. For the first time in human history, people don't know where babies come from anymore. It seems so stupid to say it, but it's true. I have so many stupid conversations at the legislature over this question. When does life begin? Nobody's ever been confused about it until we got so smart to rationalize such evil that suddenly we don't know anymore how babies come to be. That anti-intellectual, that anti-science, that anti-reason position that we have allowed to propagate across our society is the same anti-science and anti-reason 
situation that allows men to dress up like women and we have to pretend that it's real. That people can decide I'm black even though clearly you're Caucasian, okay? That, you know, your reality inside your mind is voiced upon all of us, okay? It is insanity. It is a form of insanity. It's collective insanity, okay? And it's all designed. Here's the common thread in all those things that you read about and you shake your head and go, that is just crazy. That's just craziness. It is craziness. But it's designed to shame and to destroy and to undermine the dignity of mankind created in God's image. The fight over taxpayer abortions, I told the men last night. Of course, Planned Parenthood wants your money. They get $630 million a year through the federal treasury. We have more family planning. I, literally, I've been doing this 25 years, and I learn more about this issue every day. It's unbelievable how complicated this thing is. I've been trying to get... Planned Parenthood be funded for almost the entire 25 years I've been working. I just found out last year there are seven different revenue streams coming from the federal government to Planned Parenthood to help family planning, to provide family planning services. We're the most obsessed family planning people on the planet, I'll tell you that. And they get $638 million of your, of your tax dollars every year. Why is that so important? Obviously money is important. I'd like to have, you know, one, one hundredth of that kind of a budget. But the real issue is not the money. The real issue is Satan's plan to compromise you. To get you forced into a position where you must dip your hand in a bowl of blood and share in the crime of the killing of those innocents. We do not have any choice but to fight this fight. I need your help to do it. I need your prayer support. I need your financial support. Out there we have some sign-in sheets. I would like you to give me your name and address and email address so that I can put you on our list so that I can keep you informed as to where the battle is. The battle is complicated. The battle is slow and emerging. It takes, it takes months to corner the enemy in a situation where we can get legislation passed and shut down part of their operation and it take it is tedious. The simple truth is easy to grasp. It's a human being. It's a vulnerable, innocent human life that must be protected because it's made in God's image. But the battle is complicated because everything Satan does is complicated. So we need your patience, and we need your involvement, and we need your support. Before I go, I want to share with you that um, you are blessed by some people in your community. I may never get a chance to tell you this again. I mean, you know, these opportunities come rarely. And I'm so honored to, to have this time with you. So I have nothing to lose but to tell you the truth. Because uh, I may never get back here. But I'll tell you one thing. You are blessed to have a righteous and humble pastor leading this, leading this community. And I'm honored to meet you, Pastor Mike. I met a lot of pastors around. Uh, and begged a lot of them to let me in their door. And when they do, I mean, I just said no to a lot of pastors. And I'll tell you, uh, you're special. And Lord bless you. Uh, may you support this man. 
And I'll tell you somebody else that I would like to let you know about. <clears throat> Your uh, state representative from this district is the Speaker of the House, Scott Becky. And uh, Scott and I have been hanging around together for a long time, almost that entire 25 years. And uh, he's always voted right, but I never really had a chance to get to know him until the last few years. And I will tell you something, uh, he was a, what, what really provoked him is that he was getting attacked by, uh, there are some crazy people in the Republican Party in, in, uh, in Idaho. And uh, some of them took it upon themselves to accuse him of just the most terrible things. And, uh, and these people claim to be Christians, and that, that's what really kind of got me to go about it. And I just couldn't. I just felt bad for him, and I, I ended up calling him up and, and uh, offering any prayer support and, and offering any help I could to uh, encourage him because, you know, the man has a family, and he lives in the community, and they were, tell, you know, just saying just terrible things about him. And that has actually produced a friendship, and I will tell you that we have accomplished a tremendous lot of work under his speakership and you know he's not a very flashy guy he's probably a little, you know i think he'd rather talk about anything than talking about abortion but i can tell you he cares about this issue and he's been a great blessing to me uh, and to the pro-life movement your other state representative on the other hand is less enamored of the uh, pro-life issue and uh, I would encourage any of you who might be thinking about it to think about running uh, in 2022 because the fact is we can and should do better than uh, Fred Wood, who is not a terrible person, but he's not with us really on this issue and has prevented me from getting stuff done, especially on uh, defunding of Planned Parenthood and uh, you know, he's a fine man, but I think the medical profession and his background in medicine has not been good for him, spiritually speaking. I also would like to point out, it's not in, your, in this district, but there are some people that are coming in for some pretty serious uh, attacks that I think are quite unjust. And um, I think the Magic Valley has some very outstanding legislators, uh, that, and I don't mean to say this in terms of, I don't agree with all their politics about everything, uh, they're not as conservative on many issues as I would like them to be, but they are good people and they are pro-life people. And that would be uh, Lance Clow, I think, has come in for some very difficult and unfair criticism. And I think he's actually a fine legislator. Um, and he's a pro-life person who's also been very helpful to us. And um, Linda Harkin is another person that's come in for, I think, unfair criticism uh, from some in the conservative movement. And I just want to encourage you to uh, get in touch with us and to become part of this movement because I need your help. And I will challenge you with this closing thought. I'm sure virtually all of you are pro-life. I don't know how you can be a Christian and not pro-life. But I will tell you this, it's not enough to have pro-life thoughts. doesn't really do me any good. And it really doesn't do those babies any good. The fact is, we are entering the most dangerous season I've ever seen with respect to the threat against babies in the world. This administration is unlike any we've seen in history. They are not fooling around. 
their intention is to shut this down, this meeting, this discussion down for good. You know, they've been trying to persuade us for almost 50 years that abortion is good. That abortion actually does exist in the Constitution. That it's not really a problem and it's about freedom. And they have thrown everything with the kitchen sink at us. And we are clearly unpersuaded. The fact is the pro-life movement has never been stronger because what they're saying is not true and we know it's not true. So here's the deal. They are about to enter in a new era in which they are going to shut this discussion down by brute force if necessary. That's what's coming. That's why I need you. God's people have got to rise up like we never have before. And I'll tell you something that's kind of encouraging. I don't really know how this ends, and I don't know when it's going to end, and I don't know how the Lord's going to bring this to pass. But one thing I have seen in my almost quarter century of fighting this evil, the closer we are to victory, the nastier it gets the more discouraging it becomes, the louder the noise, the obstacles become more insurmountable. It's very strange. And it's only until you get to that victory that God has waiting for you that you go, well, that really wasn't so bad. Praise the Lord. Look what he had in store for us. And that may be what's coming. That may be why this is going to be so nasty. So with that, my brothers and sisters, I just thank you for this time with you, this time of fellowship, and for giving me your, your hearts and your attention. And I ask for your help again, and may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may he defend us from you. Pray for David. Yeah. I'm hijacking this. Kelly, can you come up here too? Some people might say, you're getting awfully political there. And I'd look to Jesus, and Jesus tucked right into the issues of the day. The culture, the politics. He called truth, truth. We need to speak the truth in love, but we... You do know it says, speak the truth. We need to speak the truth Amen. in love. And there is no greater issue in our culture today than life. This is at the heart of everything that the church is about. That we might have life and have it more abundantly. And that we might be able to extend that life and eternal life to those in the world. First and foremost, to those who are coming into the world. The unborn. You know, we just read this passage in the last couple of weeks out of 1 Peter. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the King. We must do everything we do honorably. And I'm so grateful to be surrounded by three men who spend their days in the bowels of Boise legislature. And they need our prayer. They need our covering. When it says to honor all people, I don't think it's up to debate. The unborn are people. And ending their life is not honoring. We first must honor all people. And I just want to pray for these three men right now. 
If you guys would just extend your hands out towards us, if you would agree with us in prayer. Father God, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, victorious in life, vanquisher of death, Lord, and example of truth and, and honor. I pray, Lord, for each of these men as they go about the business of serving the state of Idaho, of serving you, of serving the unborn, that as they walk the halls of the legislature and they come into contact, potentially conflict, with people that are not of the same view. I would just pray, Lord Jesus, that even as they are in the middle of a conversation, that you would just, for a moment, divert their attention to look beyond the face and beyond over the shoulder of those they're talking to and to see this fellowship, hands extended towards them in prayer and know that what they do, we are with them. We support them, we hold them up in prayer and that Lord Jesus, you extend your heart and your hand to us. And that Lord, we know that when all is said and done, you are king. You are supreme. And it's our great joy to serve you. So I pray now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would continue the work that you began in these men, in this church, and on this earth to win a victory for every soul created in your image. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys.